observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema. There I am, your Archbishop of Banterbury, your Chancellor of Cheerfulness, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and, of course, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm, of course, once again, Robcasting it, you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community, this is Rob Observations episode number 655. I don't drive 655. You know, I've been working on the Satanic playlist, and um, it's long. A lot of good music on it. Uh, I've been enjoying it. I've incorporated a lot of people's suggestions, and I want to thank you. If you have more, keep them coming. Sometimes the music isn't on Spotify, which is frustrating maybe i'll just download it and make it available but i can't do that but it's coming along and we are just 10 days away from episode 666 i carved a pentagram on my ass and i've been praying no i'm just kidding i didn't i'm not really praying to the bad people the bad entities in the world but anyway i'll tell you i was thinking about something and i read an article i was thinking about something first of all from my own perspective, everyone wants to know, or everybody, wa- everyone, all of you know, that I ultimately want to do a final version of my own film, Free Enterprise. Now, most it's kind of a forgotten film. Most people haven't seen it. There's a lot of people that have, and they like it, but the it's it's not like it's some bona fide classic. And there's changes that I want to make, and I I, I think it's okay. Like I I I can change it. I think it's fine. I think I can make it a better movie, and because it doesn't have a great uh, it, it, rever- there's no there's no world that's out there going to get mad at me if I change a movie that most people haven't seen. However, I think about like the great movies of the world, and I think obviously the, the most egregious, I think, is Star Wars. And I've thought about this a lot because for 20 years, Star Wars was, you know, it, it existed the way it was. I mean... George Lucas always tampered with it. When I saw Star Wars for the years that I first saw it, it was just Star Wars. And then he added Episode Four, A New Hope, to it because Empire Strikes Back was not just Empire Strikes Back. It was Episode Five. And I understand, like, why he did that, but I lived through a period of time where Star Wars was just Star Wars. Well, if you were born in the 80s and started watching Star Wars as a kid, it was always... Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, but it wasn't always that way. And in my mind, I don't think of Star Wars as A New Hope. I don't even think of it as Episode Four. It's just Star Wars. And then again, I didn't pay much much attention to the fact that Empire Strikes Back had the five in front of it, and Jedi was six. I mean, now you do because it's Episode One. And when they would bill the uh, prequel trilogy, it was always the biggest letters. It was Episode One. You know, the Phantom Menace, Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. They wouldn't say Attack of the Clones and then make the Episode 2 smaller. It was Episode 1, 2, and 3. So they definitely were hammering home the idea that there there are nine Star Wars movies. I mean, I, 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 I'm unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that I kind of discount the last three movies in the quote-unquote Skywalker saga because they were really made outside of George Lucas's purview. So it's sort of a strange thing anyway. But anyway, the what I was thinking about, so obviously in 97 when the special editions came out, there were things that were tampered with. And over the course of the next 20 years, Lucas made a number of changes during various iterations of, of the film when it came out on DVD and then when it came out on Blu-ray and then it's on Disney+. Plus. There were There were things that were tampered with. I, to this day, still prefer the original version of Star Wars because that was the version that I saw, and a lot of the things that were tampered with were done so decades after the fact when, uh, for instance, George Lucas's opinion changed, he became a father, and so the idea that, okay, uh, the, the, the Han shooting Greedo situation was always the most egregious, I think, and I get why George wanted to change it, because kids like Star Wars, Han Solo is a murderer, 
So he's like, no, I've got to make it so Han Solo has more of a reason to kill Greedo. Greedo has to shoot first. In my mind, when I was a kid, uh, Greedo, I see this, I see it this way anyway. Greedo has already threatened Han Solo's life. Greedo's going to kill Han and take his body to Jabba the Hutt over my dead body. That's the idea. He's going to kill him. So Han Solo was always acting in self-defense. Now, I understand when you become a dad, you might get hypersensitive about what your kids watch. I, I get it. But what I never liked about uh, Greedo firing for, or Greedo, uh, well, Greedo, yes, firing first, Han Solo not firing first, is that it makes Han Solo an idiot. The change to the film fundamentally changes Han's character. When he takes out Greedo originally in the original version of the film, he shows that he is a formidable presence. He's a dangerous man, and he's going to act. He's not going to wait around while somebody takes his own life or takes his life away from him. So that's kind of how I've always thought about it. And the question that I ask is, does that change of Greedo firing first make Star Wars a better movie? And I think the answer to that is no. I think it diminishes the character of Han Solo. There are other things in the film, like I know the Moss Eisley scene with the Jabba the Hutt that they put in there um, was originally shot with a human being as Jabba the Hutt. And George Lucas is retconning of it, said, well, I always wanted to have an alien. I, I always wanted to have an alien there. I understand you might have wanted to do that, but even adding Jabba the Hutt in with CG back in 1997 for the special edition release does not look convincing. It just doesn't. I mean, I, I would have gone back and shot the actual puppet, the real Jabba the Hutt, and then comped him in using CG because it just doesn't look very good. The technology hadn't come along enough. I don't I don't know why that is. And then there's a lot of things like the entire Moss Eisley spaceport scene uh, in Star Wars. Moss Eisley used to be like a, a shithole, some East Texas shithole in the middle of a highway and you haven't seen another soul in hundreds of miles or whatever. But uh, not to put down East Texas. But the, the idea is that it's a desolate place. And now it's it's full of hustle and bustle. There are Rontos. There's mirth-filled antics with the Jawas. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But the scene where Kenobi is exhibiting his force powers, you don't need, you don't need to see his identification. That scene is ruined because uh, the tension's gone out of it because there's so much crap in the air that you're looking around in. And... Uh, it, it's just a, it's, it again, I feel it diminishes the film because the point of that scene, uh, nobody who ever watched Star Wars, and I know because I was there when I was a kid, I was there opening weekend when Star Wars opened, nobody was asking to see more droids and more activity on the streets of Mos Eisley. It was supposed to be a dangerous, out of the way spaceport. And you believed it. Because it was shot for real. The only optical effects in those scenes is the land speeder shots. And yes, some of them are dodgy. So clean those up. But we've already seen them. And uh, it worked. But when you have in the special edition, when they added all this stuff, the scene itself is diminished. Because the point of the scene is Ben Kenobi utilizing his force powers and showing Luke and the audience what's possible. The fellas has power over the weak-minded. So there was a reason for it to happen. But then you diminish the scene by changing it after the fact. Because look, any filmmaker, you always look at the mistakes, you want to change things. But George Lucas was changing things because two decades later, technology existed that didn't exist in the first place. And I think the collision of technologies, in terms of Star Wars having a lot of obvious CG creatures in a movie that didn't used to have CG destroys the verisimilitude of the film. Why am I talking about this? Well, because I think it's a philosophical question that remains unresolved. And I'm talking about it because of this. This beautiful box set that Criterion put out of Wong Kar Wai's movies. Um, and it, this is a... An amazing, I showed this off on Let's Get Physical Media. It's easily one of the things that I most wanted to buy this year. It came out early in the year. It's, I didn't have to wait like Dawn of the Dead. It's an amazing set. Now, I love Wong Kar Wai's films. If you're uh, not, not uh, familiar with him, he is a Chinese director. He makes 
Well, what he's known for and what why I fell in love with him was I fell in love with him with his film Chung King Express, which was set on the streets of Hong Kong, and he he brings a romanticism and a lyricism to daily life. The idea that wonder can happen to you wherever you are. But he also deals with criminals and low lowlifes and, and just regular people. And he, he just has a heady mix of, 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 of the daily mix with the magic. I almost want to say he's a magical realist, but he is not. Uh, well, maybe he kind of is, maybe. But, but it's just the feeling that his movies evoke in me. Um, they tap into what I believe, the same way that Amelie sort of taps into my sensibility, Wong Kar Wai somehow speaks to me about the romanticism of everyday life the way that I've kind of always thought it to be. And he has a very interesting way of mo- making movies in that he shoots a lot of stuff, but he tries to, he finds the movie in post, which is why he shoots a lot, he doesn't quite know what he's going to do, then sometimes he'll go back and redo things. But it's a different way to work than having a script and adhering to the script. He's really a, a filmmaker that goes with images and really goes what's in his mind and his heart. And he's very iterative and it's very interesting. Well, anyway, in this box set, he's gone back and revisited a lot of his movies. Done editing, moved things around, taken things out, changed music cues and everything. Now... I have all of his movies already as they've been previously released, so I wasn't going to stand on ceremony, but I know where he's coming from. I don't think Wong Kar Wai is the kind of guy that's going to shatter uh, what he's already done, the thing, the things that I love about his movies. But it's still interesting. Now, there's an article about this. Uh, David Ehrlich wrote it, and it was on IndieWire back on the 25th. And I keep forgetting to share it with y'all, but I wanted to because I wanted to talk about and maybe generate some discussion about, you know, I've always thought we've seen directors like, there's been directors' cuts of movies. I mean, when you make cuts and make movies shorter because they have to fit in a theatrical window, I, I that I can understand. Then we might get director's cuts, Peter Jackson's extended versions of Lord of the Rings, of course. A lot of my favorite filmmakers, David Fincher has a longer version of Zodiac that exists. Oliver Stone has God only knows how many versions of Alexander. I think I have three of them. Uh, Zack Snyder, uh, Watchmen, three different cuts. Sucker Punch has different cuts. Dawn of the Dead has different cuts. So filmmakers have different cuts of films, but and that's one thing. But to go back years later and tamper... With your work. Is it tampering? I mean, what is the ramifications of that? I, and since I want to do it myself, and I've actually, to a certain extent, already done it with the previously existing materials, I'm only thinking I can get away with it because I don't want to do that much to the film, my own film, but I do want to change it and just make it better. I know that what I want to do to it, most people wouldn't even know what I've done. It would just feel better. But in the case of other filmmakers that are going back years after the fact, revisiting their work and making changes, when you already have, I mean, if you've never seen Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love, uh, the movie is painfully romantic, and it's the the idea of the two people that yearn for one another but will never be together, they can't, and I mean, it's just, they pass each other by in the hallways, it's about yearning and the way I've never seen and longing, just incredible, incredible films. But he's gone back, apparently. And he's made changes to them. Now, I haven't delved into the box set. And I I don't know if I'll compare and contrast, but there's an interesting article with him that David Ehrlich wrote in IndieWire that I wanted to share with you because philosophically, he's one of my heroes. uh, and, And artistically, he's one of my heroes. And I found some of his take fascinating. So I figured, why not share it with y'all? So... Again, David Ehrlich, IndieWire, this is on the 25th. Wong Kar Wai explains the controversial new restorations of his films. I'm tired of all this cinema's dead shit. As the Criterion Collection releases a box set of his work, Wong Kar Wai explains himself. Wong Kar Wai's emails are every bit as restrained, oblique, and poetic as you might expect from someone who wears sunglasses to the movies and conjured in the mood for love. But the right question, or maybe the wrong one, can trigger a sudden pulse of raw emotion. Ask Wong if he's concerned about the future of film, for example, and he responds with the rare answer that isn't slightly canned or softened by metaphor. I'm tired of all this cinema's dead shit. 
People enjoy watching movies, period. What makes them hesitant are the risks under COVID and the costs of watching films in cinema today. For people who really care about the future of cinema, I suggest they go buy a ticket and support their local cinemas when they reopen, because many of them are barely surviving. Or at least, keep positive. These days, however, Wong seems to be less focused on cinema's future than he is on its past. It's been almost a decade since the release of the famously exacting auteur's most recent film, The Grand Master. Now he's back on set at long last to direct the pilot of a TV series he's producing from Jin <clears throat> Yasheng's novel Blossoms. Sorry, Willow, for that pronunciation. Pronunciation. And seems happy about it so far. I am lucky to be working with my crew in a safe space in Shanghai, he said, adding that his characters shall be fine under lockdown and citing the way Cop 663 talks to his soap in Chungking Express as proof that they always find a way to deal with living in their own worlds. However, much of his energy in recent years has been devoted to personally supervising the 4K restorations of his older work. Those restorations, compiled in the staggeringly beautiful box set from the Criterion Collection, have proven controversial. When screenshots began to circulate online toward the end of 2020, Wong's fans were surprised, and in several cases quite distressed, to find that the movies no longer matched their fondest memories of them. Some people, having first encountered and forever adored Chung King Express and In the Mood for Love on DVDs that stretched the aspect ratios to 185 to 1, saw the boxier 166 to 1 frames to which these films had finally been returned as a kind of betrayal, similar to how you might resent an old Polaroid for suggesting that you've been gaslit by your own wistful imagination. Already so extreme in its fisheye view of Kowloon at night, the crepuscular fallen angels had been warped into cinemascope and recolorized in a way that left some champions of Wan's darkest film, who spent the last 25 years insisting that it's less hostile than its reputation, wondering if they'd always always misrepresent it, misrep misremembered it. By the time word got out that Happy Together was now missing bits of voiceover that had been burned off the negatives in a recent fire, it felt as if we might be careening towards the art house equivalent of the Star Wars Special Editions. For Wong, however, revisiting his previous films was only worth doing because it was done in such an aggressive way. When a film needs to be restored, he emailed, there are always things that can be fixed. Otherwise, why bother with the restoration in the first place? True enough, but who's to say what's broken? To this, Wong replied that he was concerned with the limits of how much we should fix in each film without hurting it. But limits, like beauty, is a relative term. It's set in the mind of the beholder. In other words, mileage may vary, but he's still driving the car. And yet, actually watching Wong's films in this context, the eight that are included in the Criterion set and also three that aren't, has the power to seduce you to the dark side and convince you of something that screenshots alone never could. These restorations are all the more faithful to the collective spirit of their source material, because of the changes that have been made to them. From a certain perspective, they even crystallize the same elusive wisdom that Wong's characters have been chasing as tears go by. Nothing can ever be exactly like it was, even or especially if it was never that way in the first place. As Oliver Assayas once put it in a speech honoring his friend at the Lumiere Film Festival, Wong's characters are being hunted, haunted by the nostalgia of what they have not known. Which isn't to which by the way, I totally know what they mean by that. Which isn't to say Wong was unprepared for the controversy. Along with the digital release of his restorations, he included a note defending the decision to prioritize his original vision for these films over a perfect fidelity to our memories of them. An even more poetic version of that disclaimer can be found in the folds of the Criterion booklet but a key passage has been carried over. As the saying goes, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. And later, for emphasis, I invite the audience to join me in starting afresh, as these are not the same films, and we are no longer the same audience. Wong had graduated to a new metaphor by the time he wrote to IndieWire earlier this week, as someone once said, art is a never-ending dance of illusions, he wrote. 
It is impossible for us to dance exactly like we did before. What has really changed is not the films, but the man on the floor. Whatever your choice of imagery, it's understandable that such a revisionist approach might seem at odds with the fluid and slippery body of work that fixates on the past as the one thing that nobody is able to change. The beautiful people in Wong's films twist and sway through the world like kites on a string, all of them so tethered to long-expired memories, which nod around food, kitsch, music, kung fu, and sometimes even the dreams of an imagined future that they can only float through the present as tourists, in much as much an exile from their heartbreak as Wong became from his birthplace of Shanghai when his family relocated to Hong Kong on the cusp of the Cultural Revolution, leaving two older siblings behind. It might seem perverse for Wong to thaw his time capsules back into a liquid state, state especially the ones that serve as a flashbulb memory of pre-handover Hong Kong, and retcon their flavor to an extent that might throw cold water on the romantic connection that some people have to his films. The changes to the 4K restorations are almost exclusively aesthetic in nature, but Wong, notorious for unscripted shoots that stretch on for years at a time and a purgatorial editing process, should understand better than anyone the subliminal alchemy that separates an emotional touchstone from a can of old pineapples. He certainly understands that refitting Chung King Express into a different aspect ratio or slathering fallen angels under a new layer of saturation are not just superficial tweaks. I never differentiate the look of a film from its shape, he emailed. For me, they always come together like bacon and eggs. Wong should also be wary of trying to erase his own footprints. The harder that his characters try and forget the past, the more they're condemned to repeat it. That ironic cause and effect is appropriately as it's most obvious in Wong's otherwise inscrutable wuxia epic, Ashes of Time. But you can see it's scattered across all of his films, even those earlier, less orderly ones. Days of Being Wild first suggests that Leslie Chung's womanizing yuddy is ready to spend the rest of his life inside the snow globe of a single minute he once shared with Maggie Chung. The truth leaks out that Yeti is hopelessly trying to unmoor himself from a more distant memory stemming from a more distant place, like a bird who spends its entire life in the air only to discover that it hasn't flown anywhere it couldn't have walked. Yeti dies just a few miles down the track from where he was born. As Asayas described, Wong's characters in that same address, they are beings haunted by the nostalgia of what they have not known. The same might be said of Wong himself. Using these restorations to satisfy his own lingering nostalgia for the versions of his films that he was never able to realize, Wong affirms that he is much like his characters, as people tend to assume. With all of my films, there is always the temptation to re-edit, he told IndieWire, but I've mostly managed to overcome myself by not giving into it. Mostly, but not completely. In 2013, Harvey Weinstein went in on the Grand Master with the intention of shredding Wong's delicate kung fu epic for its American release, as he has done to so many films of its genre before. Recognizing how even a single punch out of place might dilute the flavor of the most ambitious thing he'd ever made, and perhaps sensing a rare opportunity to remold one of his masterpieces after it had already come out of the kiln, Wong took a proactive approach and personally oversaw the new edit. The Grandmaster is very specific, he said, of his Ip Man biopic at the time, because non-Chinese viewers don't have much information or knowledge about the background and history. You have to give them enough information for them to get into the story. <clears throat> Those changes proved controversial as well. An exhaustive list of the differences between the 130-minute Chinese cut and the 108 one released in the U.S. can be found in this article. Maybe Wong was over overeager to reach back into the proverbial tree, or perhaps he was just too close to the material to see how its new form played like a poorly autocorrected version of something that was never at risk of being lost in translation to begin with. Either way, the American version of the Grand Master is a pale imitation of the original, and the film has never found its rightful place in the upper echelons of Wong's canon because Western audiences have never been able to see it properly. And that was hardly Wong's first rodeo. First came the even more unwieldy and maligned Ashes of Time. Four years after the film bowed to a muted response in 94, Wong visited his shuddering film lab and discovered that its original negatives were already starting to disintegrate. 
He became obsessed with returning to his arid Wuxiax abstraction to the glory it had only experienced in his own mind. The decidedly mixed response to his 2008 Ashes of Time redux didn't shake his conviction that he had succeeded. We came across audiences who hated it, he wrote to IndieWire, because Redux was not exactly how they'd remember the film. What they did remember was the shaky and grainy versions copied from pirated tapes to smoky video rooms in their hometowns. What they embraced was not the film itself, but the experience of watching it. It makes me very proud to know that some of my films live in some people's memories, and I respect their frustrations. However, Wong continued, pivoting towards the river of new restorations that he's just finished, as the filmmaker, these films also live in my head. I still vividly remember how they looked, and I have the urge to fix them as close to my original realization as possible. It would be fair for the audience who haven't seen these films to meet them in their best forms, and to the audiences who feel that the man who made these films is no longer the ultimate arbiter of what their best forms might be. Like the hesitant tailor in The Hand, Wong can only hope to thread the needle between memories and reality. Vim Vendors once said that his films were personal but never private, he mused. That sounds about right to me. Wong's chaotic efforts, or quixotic efforts to satisfy his own nostalgia may irritate people who aren't ready to detach themselves from their own, but just as Tony Leung's character in 2046 can only make peace with the pain he still carries from In the Mood for Love by imagining a future that's nothing but a faint echo of his unresolved past, Wong's films are the source of his regrets, and these restorations his only way of quieting them. The essence of Wong's cinema isn't that his characters are cured of their memories, but rather that they find a way to live with them. No man ever steps in the same river twice, but it is only because they are not, these are not the same films that they allow us to trace how we are not the same people. Or as Wong emailed, the point of our restoration is not to confront or resolve any problems, but to keep the tree that holds these whispers well and healthy. I thought that was very interesting. Now, I don't know if I agree with it. I mean, I'm going to have to go back, and I, as I said, I haven't delved into this massive box set, but I want to go and watch all these movies with fresh eyes, knowing that they're, in fact, new restorations. Will I like the movies the same? I don't know. But I think philosophically, it's very interesting that that's the direction that he chose to to take. And um, again, I guess live and learn. I've never liked the Star Wars restorations. I never liked the changes, even though even in Empire, it's less egregious. But one of my favorite things in Empire was when Vader is frustrated and he just walks away. He's right, and then he walks right into the camera and you hear him say, bring my shuttle. That's all he says. James Earl Jones, but in the in the new version, it's like, bring my shuttle so I can take it all the way up to my Star Destroyer because George Lucas thought it was unclear what Vader meant. He just said, bring my shuttle. And I always love the fact, having seen Empire 26 times in the theater, whatever it was, I just love that line. I love the way he said it because it seemed so terse and final and he didn't want to be bothered with it and he just is going to go take care of business. And it's gone. I know it's just a throwaway line, but it's not there. And for me, Empire Strikes Back was slightly diminished. Now, I don't know. I might not even notice. I don't know Wong, Kar's, uh, Wong Kar Wai's films as, as well as I do Empire. But it's going to be interesting for me to go back and watch these movies and see do I feel about them the same way as I felt about them when I first saw them. I was blown away by Chungking Express. It was brought to uh, America by Tarantino's distribution company, Rolling Thunder. And I had never seen a Wong Kar Wai film before, and I immediately fell in love. And so, um, I don't know, it just really spoke to me. So it has a special place in my heart. I can't wait to go back and see. But I still don't know. I read this article, and he makes for very good points. Every time I watch a movie, I'm a different person. So movies hit you differently. So if a director wants to go back and change some things, is that not, is that should they not be able to do that? Should they only preserve the original version of the movie? And if so, why? I used to think, yes, I don't want to see anything but the original version of the movie, but mostly that's because I want it to be the way it was like Star Wars when I saw it as a kid. I feel that the Star Wars special edition, the things that they added, the technology wasn't there, so it's just not seamless. And you see the things that they added, and it takes you out of the story, um, which is a different thing entirely. But I don't know. I don't know what you guys uh, think. I don't even know if you know Wong Kar Wai's movies. 
But if you want to uh, find, I, I highly recommend In the Mood for Love and get Chung King Express and Fallen Angels because they're kind of part of the same thing and watch them back to back. Uh, yeah, so these are the things that preoccupy me today. And you know, there's a lot of things that preoccupy you and I'm going to read them because I've got a good bumper crop of letters today, including one from Willow Yang. Anonymous writes in. Anonymous writes in and says, Hi, Rob, in the Post Geek Singularity. I am writing as anonymous to predict or protect my identity. And I'm writing this letter to get this off my chest because, honestly, I'm getting annoyed with some of the things that I'm hearing about regarding Falcon and Winter Soldier's tackling of the racial issue in America. I don't care if anyone will disagree with me because I just have to speak some truth and most of us are afraid to confront the truth. Plus, everyone is welcome to a degree. I'm not here to please anyone. I'm here to share what's on my mind, and hopefully you'll all learn something from it. Um, also, to give you a little bit more context, I live outside of America, and let me give you my POV. Now, we've been getting a number of these letters, which are interesting. I love that this show is tackling the racial issue in America, whether it is in a subtle or on the nose way. Why? Well, because it happens. The racial issue in America is real. You all have to admit that. It's the truth, and the show in some ways is making us confront about it, whether it's in a small way or not. I heard some people say that the race issue would not exist in a world post-blip because people will not think about it. Now, people can still be horrible even in difficult times. People can be racist, sexist, selfish, or whatever bad thing in the middle of a calamity or a disaster. I've witnessed some of that, not at all times, but there are instances that it happens and it's unfortunate. I hate that it happens, but it happens and we must face it and confront that we human beings have flaws and we're not always the best that we can be. We human beings need to be faced with the truth that we can be horrible even in the hardest of times. You may disagree and that's okay. Maybe you don't have the experience or witnessed anything. But you have to know that not everyone is having the best experience of their lives. You have to know that some are facing horrible situations or witnessed traumatic moments and don't dismiss them just because you don't have the experience or you didn't witness it. I've seen some criticisms about some movies or shows being woke. Like you, I also believe that you should never put the agenda first before the story. I definitely agree with that. But some people are just rambling, and whatever woke thing they saw on screen, if it isn't a right reason, they panic. What's wrong with tackling social issues? For society to progress, we have to learn and face our flaws in order to move forward. I just hate that being woke is now being put in a bad light because there are times that being woke makes us learn and hopefully become better because, as I've said, we're human beings and we're flawed and we have to learn. Going back to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier... It's okay that the show is tackling the racial issue in America that doesn't happen in other countries. We people outside your country don't have to relate with it, and that's okay. At least we know what happens in your country and we learn. Why does it have to be universal? Why are people panicking that it has some wokeness to it? If they didn't tackle those issues, it wouldn't have verisimilitude. The MCU world is just like our world. It's a reflection of our world, and this is the power of art. They make us see what we as human beings and how we live here. It makes us confront it because sometimes we're not aware that there are problems around us. I'm sorry if I end up rambling here because I just wanted to get this off my chest. The direction of the conversation regarding woke and progress and social issues is taking heat, and I hate that there are people out there who put it in a bad light. You always say that every person you meet has a story to, to tell that you have yet to hear and that you just have to listen. You always say that we should listen to other people, despite political differences, etc. And you were right about that. But I have, I have observed that with the listening comes with a criticism of what they are listening to. So the point of listening does get lost, and there's no proper conversation in the end. I'm disappointed that it happens. Anyways, Rob, thank you for reading. I just needed to get that off my chest. I know I'm just rambling, but I have more to say. I'm too tired to type it now, and I have to go to bed. I will continue to be a fan of yours because you always give space to any kinds of point of view. I hope you will stick on that because some people would claim that they value others' thoughts and then they would just dismiss them immediately. 
We humans are just so weird and complicated. Have a great day and stay metal, Rob. Uh, a good letter. Yeah, I, I've i never really understood. I mean, I understand people say, well, I don't want politics to infect the stories that I, I like. But I'm like, uh, Captain America, uh, the very definition of Captain America asks you to, you, you have to wonder, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a captain of America? What does it mean to be Captain America? Captain America is inherently a political character. You cannot tell a good Captain America story without somehow addressing politics of some kind. Now, racial politics is one thing. Political, uh, actual political politics uh, is something else. And we have both going on in Falcon and Winter Soldier. And I think the show's better for it. And I, I enjoy it. So, yeah, I'm, um, I'm right there with you. I think that it absolutely... Um, uh, I'm absolutely a fan of addressing issues, especially, you know, Captain America, the winter soldier was absolutely a political thriller. The idea of the surveillance culture and what Hydra wanted to do. I mean, my God, it was integral to the plot. So it was, I mean, absolutely. Uh, Sean Holmes. So I want to thank you for writing in your letter. Sean Holmes says, I'm disappointed that you do not wear your captain power shirts anymore. I, I still do. I just, it has been cold. So I haven't switched over to my t-shirt collection. Did you give up on your secret Captain Power plan to get a reboot of the series? Do you think Captain Power can be rebooted in this era? If IP ownership issues were not a thing, do you believe Captain Power could or should cross over with the Terminator franchise or the Matrix franchise? Lastly, was Captain Power too violent to be a success in the 1980s? Should it have taken a childlike laser tag approach in TV development like the movie scene from Ender's Game where the kids shoot each other but never get killed? Well, Sean, let me tell you. At one point... Roger Lay Jr., who I worked on the Star Trek documentaries with, was in fact actively working on a Captain Power reboot with Garfield and uh, Judith and Garfield, Reeve Stevens, and all the materials. It was quite far down the road. It might happen someday. Roger's been producing movies for uh, Netflix, and I can absolutely see him. Uh, I can actually see him working. You know what? I wonder if I can call him on the phone. He'll be totally shocked. I haven't talked to Roger in a long time. I'm going to call him, I'm going to ask him. Uh, I don't even know if he knows I have a live uh, show on, um, um, mm, 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 but I'm going to call him because it'll be interesting to call him. Wait a minute. Do I not have his phone number in here? I guess I don't have his phone number in here. Oh, well, I'll have to get it. Call him later. But uh, I think that there it could still happen. You never, ever know. So don't give up on Captain Power. The reboot is really really cool they did some really cool stuff um yeah uh this one comes from Stu. Stu says hi rob thanks for reading my email on your show last week it really did make my day i've been a fan of yours since your first appearance on amc heroes alongside the big man john schnepp rest in peace Hearing you talk the other day about how you wrestle with the idea of continuing the show, staring into a green light, not knowing how worthwhile it all is, I can only speak for myself, but I would be incredibly sad to see you go. For me, it's like my favorite TV show presented by one of my best friends. I listen every day while cooking dinner for my family in a small town in northern England. Wow. There are a lot of people out there talking movies online, and they do a fine job. I do feel, however, that you offer something more a different, more philosophical perspective than your peers. Philosophy through pop culture. Ooh, I like that. Maybe I should retitle the show to that. Instead of the show about something, philosophy through pop culture. I like that a lot, but you know what? I don't know if I could call myself a philosopher. It's too close to calling myself an artist, and you know how I feel about that. There's nothing else out there quite like it, and I, for one, hope you keep providing content for as long as you're able. Anyway, I digress. Speculation time. I'm sure everybody has heard the rumor about Bucky Barnes being bisexual. Well, what if Sam is too, and their animosity toward one another is born from mutual attraction? Like kids in a playground fighting because they can't express their feelings. Sam seems to have his shit together, and I doubt he'd be repressed, but maybe this, doesn't, this just hasn't come up in any of the films. Bucky comes from a time when homosexuality was considered taboo, to put it mildly. 
I'm sure many people of his generation took this secret to their graves. Perhaps he's been wrestling with his feelings in these modern liberal times he now lives. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Marvel does seem to be diversifying, and it might make sense to dip their toe into the water on the small screen first. Keep up the good work, Rob. Would love to hear your thoughts. Cheers to yourself, the post-geek singularity. Well, first of all, thank you very much for writing in, Stu. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. That's very nice. I mean, I I guess what I am doing is is philosophy through pop culture, or at least my own philosophy. Um, I'd like that. That's it. Cre- pleases me greatly to hear you say that I'm delivering something different than other movie pundits. That's something I'd always hoped to do because. You know, I I never just wanted to review movies. I, I wanted to more... I mean, to me, movies are part of my life, so they're not just movies, especially all the things that I love. They always relate to something more. I always... I, I Some movies I see absolutely as metaphors to larger elements or larger aspects of my own life. So I want to thank you for noticing. But I like that. Philosophy through pop culture. That's definitely something... Maybe I'll put that on some merch or somebody will make a... Uh, graphic for that um though I, again my only problem is that would i would be casting my well you cast me in the role of of that the pop culture philosopher you know maybe i'll take that i don't know but thank you i really it means a lot and all the way from northern england i love it as for bucky and sam being gay and maybe one a, a getting into a relationship with one another on the surface i don't i don't have um I don't have much a pro. I don't have a problem with that. I know that at least Willow Yang and Vesna would probably want to see some man on man Avengers action. They would probably be there for it and, and quite enjoy it. Um, but I don't know from a storytelling standpoint. I, I mean, already Bucky is suffering from horrible trauma, and and then if you were going to at least in this story, I don't know if there's room for romance. But if it turns out that both the characters were gay. And they developed a romantic relationship uh, within six episodes. I don't know if they could do a very good job of dealing with that. Because they both are already dealing with problems. Bucky has, not that, by the way, not that gay is, uh, being gay is a problem. But I think the two of them engaging in a relationship during this particular adventure they're on together might get problematic from a storytelling standpoint. Um so I and, and by the way, if 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 they wanted to f- uh, make a foray into a same-sex relationship, since since they're both Avengers, you know, watching two beautifully sculpted men even engage in sexual activity, you know, I'd be there for that. I'd watch, but I think that um, I I just don't think I think it'd be too much for the show, and I think it'd be asking too much. But maybe they could at least, if it's true. I don't know. I haven't heard anything to that uh, one way or another. If it's true, maybe the the beginnings of a, a relationship like that could manifest themselves. Um, but uh, you know, I, again, I don't know. I I don't know. I just think it might be too much for this particular story. Um, and and again, I don't know. Uh, see, here's here's my thing about about um, sexuality. Like, for instance, I was talking about, was it yesterday? I was talking about the character on For All Mankind. Uh, She's gay, and she's one of the NASA administrators, former astronaut. The way they handle her, her, uh, the fact that she's gay has been really well done. I mean, she has a sham marriage to a man who's also gay, and it's worked out for them for a decade. But then, really, like all of us, there's that one that got away that she's now reconnected with. And I think that all of that seems very valid, and they're using that storyline to deal with what it was like to be gay in the early 80s, you know, for a lot of people that weren't necessarily in cities or they might have been in jobs where their external pressure found, uh, uh, pressed down upon them so they couldn't they couldn't come out, they weren't out, they couldn't be the people they really wanted to be. And I think that uh, For All Mankind has used that very, very well. I don't know if, um, if with Falcon and Winter Soldier, within the milieu... Now that would be something that they would necessarily add to those characters. I think if they're going to have a bring in a gay character, if they, the, a lot of people talked about how Valkyrie is is supposed to be gay, but I think that is something that they would bring in, um, maybe at the front end of something. We've only seen Valkyrie a couple times, but uh, you know there was 
I, I don't know. I just don't know whether whether it would be a smart thing to do to Bucky and Sam now. Um, because also, I don't necessarily think... Remember, my problem with Sam, I don't think he's got much sexuality to deal with. I mean, he did. He was a young man. He probably had, whether he was straight or gay, so does Wild Oats for a little bit. But then he was shipped off to war. He probably, whether he was meeting fleeting moments with girls in the French countryside or whatever, then he was he spent most of his life being thought out every couple of years to go pull off a job and then put back in the old freezerino. I don't know if he ever had really a chance to develop his sexuality. I don't know. Um, and sometimes I think that, you know, while you can touch on a character's sexuality, I think sometimes it can get in the way, whether you're straight or gay or polyamorous or what have you. Sometimes sexuality just doesn't belong in certain stories until it does. So, I don't know. Um, could be interesting. But, again, I don't know if it would be good for this particular story. It certainly qua caused quite the stir, though. <laughs> um, this one, speaking of that, comes from Regis K., Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. I would like to reflect on what Julian Torres wrote about a show for one people. I'll be quick. Julian is right. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 2, was not subtle. I understand what Julian said, although the word relate bothered me a little bit. It felt insensitive. Here's the thing. Prejudice is not subtle. Fighting prejudice is also very universal. There are two elements in cinema the story, and the way to tell the story. Yes, the way the story was told wasn't very subtle. I really don't know how the filmmakers should have addressed these issues when the Isaiah Bradley storyline is actually based on a comic book, itself based on real events. Even if we would like to discuss human experimentation, those happen all around the world. It's not even an American issue. A story told in the wrong way shouldn't be enough to distance us from those facts. Could the producers and filmmakers have done a better job? Certainly, but ultimately, things are what they are. And the police intervention happens every day. I understand some find it on the nose, but real life is even more on the nose than this. It happened to me when I was living in Switzerland. So yes, I relate. It's far from being another American issue. I just want to say that what happened in Falcon and Winter Soldier 2 is not subtle. Julian is absolutely right. And it's also exactly why... It touched me. Uh, Regis, great letter, and um, I think you're absolutely right about that. And uh, thanks for writing in. I really, uh, really much appreciate that. Here's another one. Hassan Chavez, our friend Hassan Chavez, writes in and says, Hello, Robert. I like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but I, too, find some aspects of the show a bit alienating. I honestly don't like that they're using Sam to depict racial issues. It feels forced. It seems that people are more accepting of stories where non-whites are victims. When a black or Latino protagonist faces adversity, people are like, oh man, shit just got real, great story, because that's what they go through in like real life, you know? But when a white hero has issues, people react differently. For example, James Bond can't be depressed. He's not allowed to fail, right? Superman can't be emo. It bothers me that creators keep producing stories where non-white characters have to be discriminated against to make them more relatable or even aspirational. Why can't they just be awesome and boldly go? You know, like any other white protagonist. Personally, victims don't inspire me. I think that's the reason Black Panther was so successful. They didn't inject victimhood into his story. All of us want to be Black Panther. I don't want to be the Falcon. I would have kept the shield. I'm not saying the MCU isn't allowed to provide social commentary. The introduction of Isaiah Bradley was good. I like that. It's just that I don't believe in a world where even an Avenger is discriminated against. It's like saying that no matter how accomplished you are, you're fucked for life because of your looks. And I disagree with that message. Uh, interesting. I mean, look, you know, I think that... Um, I guess I don't have a problem with... I, I didn't feel it was too egregious. 
I felt that, yeah, Sam was getting profiled at first, but then they flipped the script and had Bucky be the one that had a warrant out for his arrest. It's not like they put him in handcuffs and threw him in the back of the car and took him down to the precinct before they figured out who he was. I mean, they could have, but um, I, I think that the, I, I personally don't have a problem with it. I think the show is richer for it. They're just reminding you. You know, they're reminding you where the world is, that the world hasn't changed that much. So I, I actually feel it it has a place. So, yeah. This one comes from Willow Yang, ladies and gentlemen. Willow Yang. Greetings, Rob. I wasn't going to write on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but after hearing the letter from Julian the other day and their request to hear other perspectives, I thought I might as well give mine. Just to provide a bit of background information for those who don't know, I was born in Shanghai, and I lived there for almost seven years. My family immigrated to Canada in 1999, and I've lived in Vancouver for most of my life. In Canada, we do get taught some American history, including slavery, Martin Luther King, and the Civil Rights Movement, but when it comes to the issue of race relations and institutionalized racism, most of the discourse is centered on the First Nations and residential schools. I did not know what racial, racial profiling was until I started college. The first time I became aware of it was after the highly publicized shooting of Trevon Martin, and then there's the Chinese perspective. Mainland China is a very racially homogenous place, and to put it bluntly, a lot of the people there do hold prejudicial views. I've heard family members comparing black people to apes and cautioning against going on public transit with someone wearing a burqa because they might be a terrorist. Of course, not every person in China holds such views, and the vast majority of those, like myself, who spent a long time living in more ethnically and culturally diverse countries, are much more comfortable and accepting of different types of people. What do I think of Falcon and Winter Soldier? I personally have got to disagree with the notion that the series, at least up to this point, has become too agenda-driven to be enjoyed by those outside of the United States. Have they brought up social issues, namely the racism against the African-American community? Absolutely. I noticed it in the first episode when Sam's sister implied that they were being turned down for a loan due to racial prejudice. This, of course, becomes much more blatant in the second episode with the introduction of the character of Isaiah Bradley and Sam's encounter with the police. But was that the primary focus of that episode? I don't think it was. The main story right now is still very much about Sam and Buck Bucky investigating the mysterious flag smashers while also dealing with their own personal problems and grappling with the loss of Steve Rogers. If I had been in high school and I'd watched Falcon and Winter Soldier, I would still have been able to enjoy the show, even if I might not have understood the underlying social commentary in the encounter between Sam and the police officers. And yes, I do agree with those who feel that particular scene was too on the nose and heavy-handed. However, I don't think it was done in response to the civil unrests and <coughs> excuse me, civil unrest and protests that began in late spring of last year. We've got to remember that filming for this series started in late 2019 and the original release date was August 2020, but that got pushed back due to the pandemic. The first season of The Boys, which was released a year prior to the George Floyd protests, had a similar scene involving the black speedster A-Train getting stalked by a policeman while out shopping in his regular civilian clothes. It's just something that happens in America and I'm sure other countries as well, something that has been happening for decades upon decades. I haven't, unfortunately, been able to get a perspective from my cousins in mainland China on Falcon and Winter Soldier, considering that Disney Plus hasn't launched there as of yet, although I'm sure the, uh, the show is available on various pirating websites. The main problem that I see with this series appealing to an audience there is not so much because it's too focused on U.S. race relations to be accessible. I do think that Damon Lindelof's Watchmen is an example of something that may fall under that category but rather simply because, as, I, as I've stated earlier, people in mainland China tend to hold more prejudicial views when it comes to race. Many will find Anthony Mackie too unattractive to be the co-lead of the series, and he and other black actors on the show will likely be compared to monkeys and apes. But should Disney and other studios avoid having black leads because there are territories overseas that are less open to other ethnicities and cultures? 
I certainly hope not. What I'm finding rather disconcerting right now in our current social discourse is this rather bizarre desire to be constantly angry and outraged. I certainly have no love for the extreme obsession with political correctness correctness that exists on some factions on the left. I find the whole notion of microaggressions, for instance, to be exasperating and, quite frankly, authoritarian. I take no issue with people asking me where I'm from. Every time I've been asked the question, sometimes by other Asian Canadians, the person inquiring is simply trying to make conversation. I tend to roll my eyes at faux outrage pieces. A recent example being the Inverse article where the writer complained about the black character Battlestar being sidelined. On the other hand, however, I do think there are also people that are getting too sensitive and riled up over social and political messages, which have always been a part of storytelling. To quote George Orwell, But every writer, especially every novelist, has a message, whether he admits it or not, and the minutest details of his work are influenced by it. All art is propaganda. One of my favorite episodes from the Buffy spinoff series Angel is Billy. The story involves a demon turning all the male characters into raging misogynists, and it contained one of the most skin-crawling scenes on the show as an afflicted Wesley throws Fred onto the ground whilst quipping, What do you tell a woman who has two black eyes? Nothing you haven't already told her twice. I've got to wonder what the discourse would be like, how many people would be offended and up in arms over the anti-male agenda if that episode had been made today. Are Deep Space Nine episodes like Far Beyond the Stars or even Bada Bing Bada Boom, which had a scene where Cisco refused to participate in a holographic simulation of the 60s because the racism that existed during that era considered woke now? Ultimately, I'm just hard-pressed to see anything good that will come out of the culture wars we're having. I think we're all made worse off and dumber by them. We just can't seem to have nice things anymore. Regards, Willow. Uh, Willow, yes, once again, another great letter, my dear. Thank you so much. Pardon me, I didn't mean to call you my dear. Uh, I meant to say just another great letter. I meant it just like I would say folks or anything else before anyone gets too mad at me. But yeah, I mean, look, I, and since you pointed it out, I just want to, you are a, a Chinese immigrant to Canada. Uh, you did point out that there is incredible racism in mainland China because it is a very homogenized culture and anybody who comes to that culture from the outside is looked upon. I mean, it's not like China has the best civil rights record and in in terms of their Muslim population, certainly not. But yes, um, you know, I've even heard, I've heard people, I've read articles and heard things that people think that Simu Liu who's playing uh, Shang-Chi is not good looking enough to play the lead in that movie. This is Asians judging another Asian actor. Uh, but this stuff all again came from China. So look, I don't understand it. I, 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 I mean, I do, I intellectually understand it, but ultimately I just don't understand spending one iota of my time thinking about how I should dislike somebody because of the color of their skin or their sexuality or anything like that. If I like somebody and I tend to like most people, I like them. Like, as a matter of fact, I like more people that I like a lot of people that others don't like because I find something I do like in them. I just like people in general. Uh, I've never been somebody who really has any kind of a prejudice against somebody. I'm a culturalist. I'm a cultural snob. But the thing is, most different if you want to break up people into races, most people, most of the different races on this planet, and I don't even think of people that like that, but it's the culture. I, I love their cultures. Everybody has a different culture. The food, the music, the art. I mean, if you want to differentiate people, there's a way to go about it. To me, not about how people look or the color of their skin. Differentiate them based on their culture, the things that they make and the things that they do and the things that they celebrate. And that's, I think, much healthier than not liking people for the way they look. They can't help the way they look. You can't help where you were born or what color your skin is. It seems so strange to discriminate against people because of that. Um, But I know it. I know it's a big part of human culture. I wish it wasn't. This one comes from Catherine McClelland. Hello, Rob and Imagination Connoisseurs. I don't know if you'll find this interesting. However, 
I felt like sharing this with you. I was perusing YouTube when I came across this video, How Star Trek Actress Nichelle Nichols Changed NASA, published by CBS This Morning. After watching it, I thought my mom would appreciate this video, so I fired off an email. Just to give some quick context, my mother is from the baby boomer generation. She grew up in a Washington state area, and I've always enjoyed how she words herself when a particular topic excites her, as one did recently. I hope you or others, if you read this on your show, appreciate her response, and I'm writing to me back. For clarification, she did did give me her permission to quote her, and I'm sharing this in her own words. I haven't changed a thing. Enjoy. Catherine from Sonora somewhere. So this is from Catherine's mother. Catherine's mother writes, Star Trek was huge, very strong in conveying a society that we did not have in the 60s and still don't have now in many ways, but one we should work toward creating. Lots has changed and lots has stayed the same. Her role, Nichelle Nichols' role, was that of the communications officer, and to my eyes as a young teen, it was like the position of the secretary, the person doing all the work that makes an office run while the men in the office tell the secretary what to do and take all the credit, and the much, much larger paycheck. In many offices, the secretary was the smart one in the office and could actually perform all of the jobs in the office and knew all of the details and strengths of the company, but each individual who worked there. But in the 60s especially, none of the men in the office would have been able to type a letter or locate a file in the file cabinet or would know how to get things done or how to do any job other than their own job. They were too busy patting themselves on the back, drinking their lunch t- drinking during their lunch times, and planning their next adulterous affair, golf game, or vacation. The role of the secretary was to do all of the behind the scenes, perform this work flawlessly, and keep the secrets of the men she worked for for zero too little credit and make the man she was working for look smart, capable, and effective. To my eyes at this time, I was very sad that the role of Uhura was given to, uh, was given uh, that it was based, to my eyes at this time, I was very sad that the role of Uhura was given, uh, there's a word that's wrong here, to basically that same role as a secretary. Like in the 60s, she was stunningly beautiful and very sexy, and that was often what the highest level CEOs of the company wanted at the desk in front of the door that led to their office. A gorgeous secretary was a huge status symbol. In my mind, as a young female teen, I really wanted to see her play the chief of engineering or security or really any role that was not similar to that of the secretary, nurse, or teacher, the only appropriate roles for women in the workforce in the 1960s. I would have loved to see her play any role that was not reminiscent of the role of secretary, whose job was to handle the communication, letters, phone calls, etc. for the business. Yet Star Trek was breaking all sorts of old ideas right and left, but at that time, women had their place and it was to support men in their pursuits, not run the company or lead the way. Even the opening credits for Star Trek said, where no man has gone before. It was the mentality of the time deeply rooted into the fabric of the times. There were real black women in NASA in the 1960s doing amazing scientific and math work. If you haven't seen the movie Hidden Figures, it is well worth your time and clearly shows the struggle of a woman with a brain, uh, how a woman with a brain struggled against the society of the time. My parents and I had massive fights over who I could or what I could or should major at in college. They saw me as a female that could be a big help to a man in an office like her secretary or a bookkeeper, but never, ever, not in a million years, the CEO or head of a department. It was a hard thing for me to stand on my own two feet and disobey their ideas, but I did just that. I was so tired of being put into a box by men like my male teachers did at high school. I had a brain and I wanted to use it. You see, Star Trek did influence me, but I wanted to have full equality with men not just be able to vote in an election, but to make a difference in the world through my ideas and work. My hope is that the future for Elena will be a world where she is not limited by her gender into traditional areas of work, that she will be able to work in a field that thrills her, and that she will enjoy her successes as her own, and not need to share her successes with other men who want to take all the credit. The same with you and Becky. My heart's desire is that you find work that you love to do, are good at it, and it brings you joy and success. There are so many potential areas of success for you. Your ability to tell a story is magical. 
I don't know if you heard, but children's book author Beverly Clary just passed away last week. She was 104 and wrote the Ramona and Beezus books. I remember reading some of her books to you both, but I thought she was much younger, closer in age to me. Her books have a timeless quality. She was brilliantly creative and her characters were real. You also create characters that linger in one's mind for decades. You are brilliant too. Love, Mom. Uh, that's from Catherine McClelland, and that was her mother. How interesting that all of these articles are talking about race issues. You know, I think her mom was being a little unfair. As everyone knows, the first woman I ever ever had a crush on was Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura, and that was before I really, I mean, to me, the fact that she was black was just an interesting character trait. I, I had yet to learn about racism when I was a young five-year-old whippersnapper. Uh, to me, I thought Nichelle Nichols was one of the most beautiful creatures I'd ever seen, and I really loved her green hoop earrings. I didn't understand we weren't supposed to like people of different colors. I didn't understand what racism was. It makes no sense to me now. It didn't make any sense to me then or when I was like eight years old and heard about it for the first time. I'm like, why would somebody not like Lieutenant Uhura because of the color of her skin? She was really good at her job. Now, I understand what Catherine's mother is saying. She basically answers the phone on the Enterprise. But she also uh, is in charge of all communications, ship-to-ship communications, ship-to-earth communications. She has to be fluent in all kinds of things. We've seen her fixing her own station, so she's very technically oriented. And she's been able to uh, get messages out when things were in a bind. And I, I never saw her as, a, as somebody's secretary, but I can understand. Look, she was answering the phone. I totally get it. I totally get it. But... Unless you're Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, everybody on the bridge is on the bridge because they're valuable, incredibly valuable to the the way that the Enterprise works. But I understand where your mom was coming from, especially back then if you were growing up in that time. It makes sense to me. Um, I wonder what she would... I mean, obviously she wrote this about what it was like in the 60s, but I wonder if she still feels that way. It's um, It's interesting. Good letter. Tell your mom thank you. Why well, maybe you shouldn't tell your mom you or did you say you it's okay to read it? But what a great letter, Catherine. I want to thank you for writing in. Uh, it's so interesting getting see getting people's perspectives. Like I always thought, I would never have thought that a woman would have thought Lieutenant Uhura, Uhura was just a secretary. But it's interesting that your mom did that. That that's um that's really interesting. Um. This letter comes from Darren Prescott, not the stuntman. Greetings, Rob, Mike, mods, and all the post-geek singularity. Hope all is well in your galaxies. With Warner loudly and proudly proclaiming they're looking to wrap up the Snyderverse with the release of the Snyder Cut of Justice League, and that's despite the subsequently being huge outpouring of support from an outcry for more, I worry that the studio has an inherent marketing problem when it comes to the DCEU. Just consider this. Many years ago, I took a marketing course at night school, and the big fundamental I took away from that course was find out what your customer wants and fulfill that requirement at a profit. Admittedly, in the pandemic era, Warner Brothers may never be able to recoup their outlay if they produced another Justice League scale project, but their decision to so heavily downplay plans for more in the Snyderverse, well, that seems to me as if they're either unaware of the marketing maxim or worse, they know it and are just crassly disregarding it. Whichever is true, in Warner's case, they have, in my opinion, simply and deliberately put themselves at odds with the many fans who have paid for and so enjoyed the Snyder movie. But the problems are not just Warner. I fear it's at many of the studios and networks that the custodians of many of our favorite and classic franchises are not getting it. Modern cinematic Star Trek took a huge left turn when Paramount decided it should be more like Star Wars, with Star Wars' billion-dollar box office to match, and three movies in, hopefully they now realize that's not going to happen. Discovery jettisoned the tried and proven Trek characters and storytelling formulas because someone decided they needed Game of Thrones in space. Star Wars, the sequel trilogy box office performance, is down around 50% from the first movie to the third. There are many possible reasons for this, and hopefully Lucasfilm are researching them, but my suspicion is the decision to do so and underutilize the original main cast plus a failure to give them satisfying closure was a huge factor. Just some examples, and opinions are my own, of course, plus I probably oversimplify a bit. Significantly, there are still winners. 
James Bond and the MCU being among the most notably successful ongoing franchises, but even Bond hasn't had a movie release in six years. And as for the MCU, even that defers to the pandemic. But what about cinema as art, some might ask? Well, let's put it this way. Kubrick is gone. If you're spending $250 million on a movie or $10 million on an episode of TV and in the long run you're looking for a profit, then it's no longer an art concern. It's a product first. Product that your investors or sponsors will be wanting an audience to consume. And everyone, all the way along the line of investment and production, will be looking to lock in a profit from that. And how do you do that? Well, you could start by researching what your audience wants and maybe listen to them when they're telling you what they want. Anyway, that's my two cents. Not sure if you agree, but I do suspect that a little bit of marketing news rather than a I know exactly what you want attitude could put many of the established but floundering franchises either creatively creatively or financially back on course. Peace and long life. That comes from Darren Prescott. Um, well, Darren, I can't disagree with you. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, they're trying to make these things, in, 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 in making things different uh, or making things their own. Like if you work, here's another axiom. I always put your characters and stories first. Never put your universe before your characters and stories. Well, I'll tell you what. You do have to put your franchise and the characters and stories that your franchise has chosen to tell first and foremost when you're trying to tell new stories within that franchise. What they're trying to do is tell different stories. It's as if they don't want to be working in the franchises they're working in, so they're trying to change those franchises to be more along the likes or more along the lines of the paradigm of whatever is, let's make Star Trek Star Wars, and let's hope when we do that, it'll get more of an audience and make more money. But they've proven that that's not the case. The three Star Trek movies have left no pop culture imprint on this planet. Uh, People still think of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy as Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, and William Shatner. So, yeah. Uh, Paul in Long Beach has written in a review of Godzilla vs. King Kong. I got a call this morning, Rob. A golf buddy rang up and said, Hey, Paul, want to go see Godzilla vs. Kong in an hour? I scored some preview tickets. I've not been inside a movie theater in over a year, the last time being onward, so my answer was, Get your ass over here. Let's go. So guess what? I went to the movies today, and I feel like a giddy schoolboy right now. No spoilers, of course, just a warning. You're going to be creaming your jeans for the entire film. In fact, bring a box of tissues because you'll be wiping from pure joy. (laughs) I know I was. It was everything I wanted in a kaiju flick. So I'm happy today. Maybe, just maybe, things are going to be getting back to normal. Damn, dude. Now I want to see it again. Well, Paul and Long Beach, what a great review. Um... You know, we're going to get Spooge and Suicide Squad in the version of Angel's Tears. And apparently, I'm going to get Spooge in my pants from watching Godzilla vs. Kong, which is really never a bad thing. So, I'm there for that. Hell yeah, I am. So, definitely. I'm in. (laughs) Uh... Catherine McClellan has written back also to me another letter. And um, <laughs> she writes, and I'm going to read this again because it's it's great. I mean, I haven't read this I haven't read this before, but I'm reading a second letter from her today because I like this. So once again from Catherine McClellan. She writes, "Hello Rob and fellow imagination connoisseurs. I'm writing this letter as an attempt to have the song One Winged Angel" added into your devil-related musical playlist for your upcoming 666th show. For clarification, the subject of the song is not the devil himself. However, due to other aspects surrounding it, I'm hoping to convince you to incorporate it into your playlist. The term one-winged angel refers to the fictional character of Sephiroth from the video game Final Fantasy VII. (laughs) God, I love this audience. I really do. I love you guys and girls and gentle beings and kind souls. However you identify, I love you. I love you all. The name Sephiroth derives from the word Sephiroth, 
or sephiro, which literally means counting. Sephiro comes from the Kabbalah, hmm, which is a school of thought originating from the Judaic religion. There are ten sephirot on the tree of life. Each sephirot depicts an illumination of God's infinite life that shows up in God's creation. Through these ten sephirot, God reveals his will. In the video game, the term Sephiroth ties to Sephiroth's character as he wishes to become a god himself. I'll now zero in on the title. In the animal kingdom, beings cannot fly with merely one wing, as the song's title suggests. One winged angel alludes to the concept of a fallen angel. The title also might be a reference to the Testament of Solomon. It featured a one winged demon named, ooh, this is a tough one. A Bezabo is shown to have a single, a single red wing, this mutilation symbolizing his fall from heaven following his betrayal of God to serve the Prince of Hell, Bezalo. Now let's talk about the musical aspects of this song. This song was the first in the Final Fantasy series to feature vocals, and it was arranged for the chorus to be sung in the Latin language. How metal is that? That's pretty fucking metal. The One-Winged Angel song in the original Final Fantasy VII game plays in the background during the Safer Sephiroth stage boss fight. He is depicted in this fight having seven wings. While the wing on his right arm looks to be more for show and is obviously the wing the song references, the six wings beneath Sephiroth's body are what actually keep him afloat, likely representing the six wings Lucifer, another fallen angel, has in Dante's Inferno. Thanks for reading this. Hope some of my research into this song may have convinced you to add to your playlist. So many versions of the song have been made over the years, it's hard to select one. However, if you want my husband's opinion, he suggests the following. On iTunes in the search bar, type One Winged Angel and look for the album Final Fantasy VII Reunion Tracks by Nobu Umatsu. That track is an orchestral version and we both found it very good. The original PlayStation song is also available as well. However, I think most audiences listening to your show would appreciate the layered orchestral version instead. Truth be told, I and my husband are believers in God. However, we find it entertaining that on your 666th show, you want to celebrate the rich history the Prince of Darkness has in pop culture and entertainment. And we're all for it. Keep up the good work, Catherine. Well, Catherine, uh, thanks for writing in. I like that. Um, you know what? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Uh, I'll give you all a preview of the playlist of where I'm at on this playlist. Um, I will read you the names of some artists that appear on this playlist. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith, Ella Fitzgerald, Alice Cooper, ACDC, Robert Johnson, Bomb Baby, Iron Maiden, Big L, the Beatles, Van Halen, Cliff Richards, Tom Waits, Immortal Technique, Snoop Dogg, Judas Priest, Simply Red, Metallica, uh, Lee Scratch, well, hang on, um, Lee Scratch Perry, Arcadia, Skip James, The Grateful Dead, Spinal Tap, Jelly Roll Morton, Ghost, The Crown, Gamma Bomb, more Black Sabbath, Eagles of Death Metal, Rob Zombie, Enforcer, Diamond Head, Johnny Cash, Beck, Elvis Presley, Robert Plant, Lordy, Mogwai, Japan Droids, Biffy Clearo, Tenacious D, Gene Vincent and his Blue Caps, Morrissey, Steve Earle, Reverend Horton Heat, Kid Rock, Chris Christopherson, Laura Marling, Delane, The Reverend Bizarre, Billie Eilish, DMX, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, but that's some of the people that appear on the Satanic Playlist which currently is sitting at um, 92 songs, and it's 6 hours and 59 minutes long. For those of you who are interested, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I'm, there's a lot more to do. Let's see what all of you have to say today. I'm going to see what you all have to say today. Let's jump into that uh, and come over here and find out. Um... Mm, 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 mm. Uh, Jonas Larson sends in a tip. My God, I got to tell you, this is one. Uh, this, okay. Let me, let me just read these first. Heard of the empty man. 
a way too overlooked 2020 cosmic horror film by David Pryor. It is so good. The trailer does not do it justice at all. Pryor has a career doing home media releases for David Fincher, and there's a Fincher-esque feel to it. The Empty Man got dumped in theaters and has a low audience score due to a very misleading trailer. This is a cosmic horror film for adults. No jump scares, a clever, complex story, and a 25-minute intro. I truly recommend it. Jonas, The Empty Man. I know David Pryor a little bit. I mean, obviously I know who he is. I've met him. Um... I'm fascinated. I've yet to watch The Empty Man. Over the last month, I have been getting inundated by people. Well, not inundated. I mean, I've been seeking them out. But a lot of people, there is a huge re Empty Man renaissance going on. I watched Chris Stuckman's review of The Empty Man. I've read about The Empty Man. And it is right up my, my alley. I can't wait to watch it. By all, all accounts, it is a great film. Um, everyone is reassessing The Empty Man now. And I, I know what it's about. I know it's kind of, I know it's, I guess call it a twist. Is it a twist? Um, it's so up my alley. I, I just haven't watched it yet. Maybe I'll watch it tonight. Uh, I can't wait to see The Empty Man. And you are correct. It's exactly what I want. And again, I hope it gets reassessed because, man, it sounds dope. And everything, I mean, everything I've seen of it, it was Stuckman's review, though. That I was like, wow. Then I watched the interview with David Pryor, and a lot went on. It was really, unfortunately, it, it was it was a casualty of the Fox Disney merger. So, yeah, let me um before I uh let me just take this out here and um so I can see this so I can actually read this so it's not so. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to watch. I think everybody should watch The Empty Man. Willow, Willow says sorry if you've already answered this, but what's your take on the Harvey Rachel debate? Meaning Harvey Dent. And our, our girl, Rachel, like who's played by two actresses. Like most people, I thought Joker tricked Batman by switching the addresses. Do you think Batman might have changed plans off screen and purposefully gone for Harvey? No, I think Batman was tricked. I, I don't think he purposely went after Harvey. I think that he would have gone after Rachel anyway if he could because she's a woman. I think Batman is chivalrous. And I think that... Um, he would try to have, have rescued them both. So I, I think he did get tricked. Uh, Willow also says, hashtag Team Godzilla. Yes, yes. My love for you is still boundless. If you're Team Kong, that's it. That's it, Willow. You're out of the family. So, but you're, since you're Team Godzilla, my love for you still burns. Uh, Dakota says, seeing how Citizen Kane was based on the real-life tycoon magnet William Randolph Hearst, in your opinion, let's say that if Citizen Kane were filmed today, based on today's tycoons, who would Kane then be based off of? Donald Trump or another business tycoon? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Mm, I don't think, definitely not Donald Trump. Um, I mean, at least William Randolph Hearst collected great art. And you can go up to San Simeon or whatever and see the real, what he wrought up there. I don't know if there's anyone quite like William Randolph Hearst. I don't know if there's people like that that exist. I mean, my first impulse would, would be to say someone like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. But Elon Musk is living his life out publicly. I, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think there... Again, I don't know enough about my tycoons. But, um, I mean, the thing is, if you made it about Donald Trump... See, the thing is, regardless of my political affiliation, and Donald Trump did say for the longest time that he was a Democrat and could pull one over on Republicans, I just think Donald Trump is not a very compelling figure. I think he's, as much as he might have money and all that, I think he's kind of a unique failure, even though he's been president of the United States and where he's at now. Um, but he, I don't think he's... I, I, I don't think he'd make a good William Randolph Hearst or uh or citizen or our citizen Kane. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. I don't know if if I it would have to be a different kind of a movie. I don't know if you could do Citizen Kane today. But it's a good question. Sheriff Carl sends in a tip and says I don't remember my life without Star Wars being the center of my galaxy. Luckily, I've kept pretty much all of my Star Wars shit from over the years. I even taped off TV copies that were my virtual babysitter where I'd watch them in my basement with all my toys. <laughs> nice. Nice. Remember that? You could tape off and so that you couldn't record or you could bust out the little tab. Han Solo sends in a tip and says, shoot first and next and last. 
and try and squeeze in some shooting in between the shooting. The point is shoot everything all the time, especially if it's fucking Greedo, and try and do it first. That shit helps. Goddamn right, Han Solo. Sheriff Carl sends in a tip and says, I was born in 83, so the OG trilogy was always a complete known thing to me. I'll admit I was excited for the special editions. Star Wars was back and I was 13. To see them with friends in the cinema was so rad. Other than Empire Strikes Back, the special editions were not that metal. They were decidedly not metal, Sheriff Carl. Not metal at all. Um, uh, I wish we could get the unaltered cuts on 4K. I may or may not have them on Blu-ray. But I still have all the various releases and my memories of how they will, were will always be in my Star Wars trilogy. I don't hate the special editions. I just wish we could have the OG cuts. I have the OG cuts. Um, various iterations of them. But I, I, I think that I'd love to get them officially released. I really would. Um, in, instead, we just have to last or, or keep our fan-made versions. Uh Ziggy sends in a super chat and says, Classic movie released on 4K today, The Ten Commandments. So shall it be written, so shall it be done. That's right. Good good 4Ks today. Perdita, Durango, and Day of the Beast also came out on 4K. The um, Alex De La Iglesia films, those are good. Got to get those, but you're right. Uh, Sheriff Carl says, I take it you didn't see the Ewoks on ice at the Seattle Coliseum in 1986? I did not. I did see Kiss in the Coliseum, though. Uh, that is one of my earliest memories. I was thrilled. People didn't believe me that it was... Wait a minute. Um, I was thrilled. People didn't believe me that it was real until Google Images came along. P.S. Ewoks are metal as fuck. <laughs> fuck. Yub fucking yub nub, dude. <laughs> they are. Uh, James Lockman sends in a tip and says, congrats on getting your hands on a PS5. What kind of games do you play? You should play Ghost of Tsushima. That's 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 top priority. If you haven't yet, it's an epic game. Looking forward to the new Gran Turismo, God of War, Ragnarok, and all the action RPG Harry Potter games. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have any PlayStation 5 games. I, I uh, Sophie was, I was playing a little, uh, she has a lot of PlayStation 4 games, but I kind of want to keep it pure. I don't want to fill it up with a bunch of stuff. Uh, yes, I, I, I won't use their name, but uh, a viewer hooked me up, a viewer of this channel hooked me up graciously with a PlayStation 5, and you know who you are, and I thank you very much for it. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. It's a beautiful machine, um, so it's great to have. I loved, I've loved, I've loved all iterations of Gran Turismo. Uh, it'll be fun to play that. Um. I can't wait to get into that. And Ghost of Tsushima, I, you know, I watched a whole video and I was playing around with frame rates and stuff. I watched a video of the differences between, um, oh God, uh, Alone, uh, I forget, but, and Ghost of Tsushima, the differences of playing things on the PlayStation 4 as opposed to the PlayStation 5 and frame rates. It's amazing. It's amazing. PlayStation 5 is amazing. Will N says, the Grandmaster is by far the best Ip Man retelling. I felt it was such a cinematic movie. Now I'm learning that the American release was dumbed down. How do we get the original director's cut to experience how it was meant to be? I bought a foreign disc of it. I bought a Hong Kong disc of it, subtitled in English. So that's where I got that's where I got mine. So yeah. Um D Duval fifty nine sent me well, that is a very generous super chat, sir. Thank you very much. D Duval fifty nine says, "I liked Godzilla fourteen, um, and I liked Kong Skull Island, but I was severely disappointed by King of the Monsters. I dreamed of that movie since I was eight, and I couldn't believe I didn't like it. The positive reviews of Godzilla vs Kong have me hyped all over again. Maybe this is the one my eight year old self dreamed of. You know what? I it's so strange to me. I." I loved Godzilla. I mean, I love Godzilla King of the Monsters. I loved it. I mean, yes, full disclosure, I know Mike Doherty, obviously, but it really spoke to me the way I, when I was little, and, um, you know, I, 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 I was watching, like, my favorite uh, kaiju films, my favorite Godzilla movies were like Godzilla vs. Monster Zero or Destroy All Monsters. I, I even have a fondest, a soft uh, place in my heart for Godzilla vs. Megalon. 
and I love Rodan and Mothra, and I I, I think that I, King of the Monsters. I mean, I loved I loved seeing how big it looked, but it was yes, it was a little goofy, it was all over the place, but I I still loved it. A lot of people just don't like it, and uh, you know, judging from Paul and Long Beach's letter and Drew McWeeny's review, I think King of the Monsters or pardon me, Godzilla versus Kong. It's going to kick ass. It's going to be what we're looking for. Look, I love Pacific Rim. So far, Pacific Rim has been my, I think it's the best kaiju movie of all in terms of modern stateside made monster films. I love, not the second one. I, I haven't watched the new anime, but I think I, I, I love Pacific Rim. That to me was the ultimate, <laughs> it's just, and it's not perfect either. Uh, I want to see the three Chinese triplets kick some ass before they got their ship destroyed before they got their jaeger destroyed but still uh i love that film and i'm i'm i have high hopes um i like godzilla 2014 and uh kong skull island i love too so you and i have exactly the same taste as far as that goes but for some reason we part a little bit part ways I, i'd be curious why um did you not like king of the monsters was it because it, you felt it was disjointed or you didn't like the human beings or I just thought it was so ambitious. Maybe it didn't all hang together. Uh, I just, I loved it. I loved it. Um, Louise Sparrow said, Hi, Rob. I'm wondering if you're going to get the new Star Trek Voyager documentary. Well, Louise, yes, I will. I can't wait to see it. They're crowdfunding it. They passed a million dollars. So just like with the Deep Deep Space Nine documentary, what we leave behind, they're, they're the same crew basically is making a Voyager documentary, and I'm definitely going to get that. Um, Louise, I thank you for sending in a tip. Um, but I definitely want to get that Voyager documentary. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. Um, Nick Parrish says, so Rob, on the eve of Godzilla versus Kong, I just want to reflect on what I've always loved about these two characters. The one thing I love is that Kong and Godzilla are really just two old men who don't like people tearing up their lawn. <laughs> In the first Godzilla movie, Godzilla really just went after the parasite monsters because they were making a whole bunch of noise and tearing up his Hawaiian vacation spot, interrupting his sleep and his daily swim. <laughs> and in Kong's case, Kong Skull Island, Kong had just got out of bed and the first thing he sees is people making a bunch of noise, bombing his lawn, killing his neighbors. Of course he was going to break some fools off. <laughs> this is why I love these two. <laughs> you know what? I never thought of it that way, Nick, but you are correct, sir. <laughs> that's hilarious hilarious uh um alexander wilson says movie trivia movie trivia rob name all the movie soundtrack albums that were the highest selling album of the respective year that it was released oh my god some are very easy to guess but some are like i didn't know a lot of people actually like that soundtrack oh my god that's alexander that's totally hard i mean i wouldn't know let me see. I'll guess. All the movie soundtrack albums that were the highest selling album of the respective year that it was released. I would say the first one I would I would go my first go to would be Saturday Night Fever. Um, maybe the second one that I would go to would be Grease. Um, Flashdance, Dirty Dancing. I mean, I should go back further in time. Uh, American Graffiti? Gosh. Um, uh, that's all I can come up with right now in terms of, uh, I'm just, in terms of thinking about musical soundtrack albums. I don't know. Did Judgment Night sell? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Those are the things that popped off me. Uh, Julius Goodwin, hello Julius, the official sommelier of this channel. Julius Goodwin is here. Julius says, with my schedule like it is, I can never get to, <laughs> I can never get you and Miss Elizabeth together on the same show to ask, but I've always wondered, what does she want to do when she graduates? Is she going to work for you as chief animator of action figures, CFO or producer? That's a good question. She I can call. Let's call her up right now. She might be in class. I'll see. She might not be able to answer. She's in virtual school. Hello, are you in class? Yeah. 
Can you answer a question? Yes. Julius Goodwin sends in a tip, and he wants to know, um, what do you want to do when you graduate? Are you going to work for me as chief animator of action figures? Do you want to be a CFO? Do you want to be a producer? What are you going to do once you get out of Art Center? Really? What What are some of the things you're thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about going to get my master's. So that'll be another three years. Okay. And then what? Um, I, I'm really not sure. You're going to fine art school. You're going to Art Center, which is one of the most prestigious art colleges in the country, and you're not sure. So you kind of put me on the spot. I'm uh, trying to think while listening. All right, because I can hear that you're in the class, and you're probably talking to me, and you're on the phone, so you look rude. No, I, I turned my camera off, so they can't see me. But oh. If I'm gone too long, my teacher will notice. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, think about it. I'll get back to Julius. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Bye. I put her on the spot. She knows. She either wants to teach, work in a museum, that kind of thing. Um, but I did put her on the spot, so I'm sorry. Uh, 200 Watt Studio sends in a super chat and says, I got my Warner Archive discs. Eight. Also, the Black Stu Sunday Blu-ray is stunning. It is stunning. Uh, congratulations on... You got to get those Warner Archive discs because how long are they going to even sell them anymore? It's kind of a bummer. Um... Sheriff Carl says, hashtag release the Star, Star Wars Snyder Cut, hashtag smoke hash, hashtag uh, like, oh, like an Ewok. <laughs> smoke, like an Ewok. Okay, all right, Sheriff, we will. Um, James Lockman says, one thing I've never bought myself is a steering wheel controller for racing games. Right now I'm playing a game called Car Mechanic Simulator on my PlayStation 5. Get cars from the auction, take apart everything from the engine, suspension, and body panels. I am so there for that. Car Mechanic Simulator. That is so cool. I would totally be into that. I, um, I would totally be into that. <laughs> Who makes that? I'm going to go find it. Uh, Claudius is here. Hello, Claudius. Uh, first couple we're getting, we got our, we got our, uh, our, uh, sommelier and we got one half of the first couple of the Burnett work. Claudius says, bonsoir, Monsieur Robert. I want to commend Willow Yang on her letter in response to Julian Torres. Um, I agree with her. Racism or ethnocentrism is a universal problem or universal phenomenon. I also think it's an appropriate story element for Falcon and Winter Soldier's story. As I've mentioned before, scientific racism, which legitimizes racial hierarchy, is more insidious than simple cultural prejudice. It is espoused by people who are nefariously trying to justify racist concepts. I Look, I agree with you. I was somebody that, that I, I completely agree. And I, I find racism strange considering uh, our, different, our external differences were defined by environment more than anything else. So it's bizarre to me. And I like the way Falcon and Winter Soldier are dealing with these things. You know, with, with uh, imagine what it's like. Like all of these people, half the world just shows up. What are neighborhoods like? Uh, it's crazy. Oh, Al okay. Alexander Wilson is back. Um, Alexander Wilson says, West Side Story in 62. Mary Poppins in 65, Saturday Night Fever. The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston, The Lion King, Titanic, High School Musical, and The Greatest Showman are the answers. Your thoughts on those albums? Well, you know what? I love West Side Story. I have that album. Mary Poppins, that makes sense to me. Saturday Night Fever, I love that record. Uh, the Bodyguard, I never owned, but that makes sense. Lion King, absolutely. Titanic, which is funny because I was thinking about songs, but I have the score. I like Titanic. The High School Musical, of course, because it was a thing, but it passed me by, but I wouldn't have thought about it. And The Greatest Showman are the answers. Wow. I think they're all good albums. I like, you know, the first time I heard The Greatest Showman, I hadn't seen it yet. And John Campia was playing it for me in in in, in, uh, 
in his car and he knew all the lyrics to all the songs. He's a total song and dance man, that guy. Um, yes, I, uh, I think those are all good albums and it makes sense to me. Um, no Grease though, huh? Wow. What do I know? Interesting. Claudius goes on to say, personally, Rob, I find the discussion of race exhausting. For myself, and I think others like me, it's a lifelong burden. We despise the compulsion to explain, refute, or correct misconceptions, not opinions about race. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, and I think, I think you know, it was. I think we were doing a good job. Look, it might be, have been taking a long time, but I think the discussion. I think things were things were getting better. Society was evolving. I think that we have. Uh, we have somehow stopped that natural process and thrown a monkey in the works, so to speak, uh, a monkey wrench in the works. The machine is sputtering because of certain things that have happened. But on the other hand, all these things are necessary. But I agree. 200 Watt Studio says, Hong Kong Rescue Update. The killer will be ready in about a week and bullet in the head files are on the way. Well, that is fantastic. I can't wait. I'm still, you know, I ordered some discs back in December I haven't received yet, and I, I love what he's doing, but um, and I know he's busy, so I can't wait to get the killer. Hong Kong Rescue is a guy, basically one guy, who's restoring Hong Kong action films, Jackie Chan movies, things like that, and I can't wait to, to get his stuff. What he's doing is amazing. It's amazing. Claudius says... I encourage everyone to do their homework. Like Willow Yang, I encourage everyone to conduct a cross-check before discussing race. Are you simply frustrated? Are you virtue signaling? And have you researched the facts? Uh, Michel Robert, I am loving the constructive conversation, thoughtfulness, intelligence, and positivity of the channel. Well, I'm I'm glad. I mean, I you know, I can be nothing but positive. <laughs> I mean, Living on this planet as a human being in the Goldilocks zone, <laughs> where uh, around our planet's soul here, uh, it's a pretty good place we live on. And I'm glad that we can have constructive criticism. I don't, I don't find, you know, it, it's kind of like maybe it's, it's, it's being in the, in the film business. When you want to work making movies, making movies is, is kind of an inherently positive act because, well, you know, everyone's getting paid if you are working for a studio. You, you you know what your end result is and you know why you're working towards it and um i uh i um uh I, i'm glad i mean i think this I, I i'm inherently a positive person i like being alive i mean the bummer the biggest bummer in my life is going to be when i'm dead because i'm going to miss out on all this great stuff i know people are like well what do you care rob you're going to be dead i'm like i don't want to be dead I mean, if I could be immortal for 2,000 years, I would totally do it. I'd totally do it. I, You know what? Even if someone said, okay, Rob, you can be immortal, but you have to be a vampire and you have to feed on other human beings. You know, I'd still want to be immortal. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I might have to compromise my morals, but um, some people need killing, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yes, I'm glad the positivity can last. And I think that's what I want. We should be here to have... This place should be a place of fun, spirited, intelligent, insightful conversation. At least, I hope that's what this place would be. So I'm glad that you feel that way, Claudius. Uh, you know, I've, Claudius is a very smart, learned man. I have a lot of respect for him. So if he feels that way, I feel good. Um, uh Louis Terraza says, hey, Rob, have you ever seen Operation Finale? It's amazing. You know what? I have not, and you are the second person in, like, the last two days who's asked me this. Um, and I don't know this. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. And it's, yeah, the arrest of uh, Eichmann. I haven't seen it. People keep telling me about this. And that and 000, this show, zero, they have nothing to do with each other, but, man... I need to go watch this movie. Uh, where can I see it? Because I've I I um I don't know where it is. I gotta go find it. But you're the second person, so Louis, I'm uh I'm gonna go watch it. Uh, James Lockman says, "Are you into VR?" I am, but I've never I've I've I don't I don't have a, a Oculus headset or anything. 
You can play Star Wars Squadron in VR. I believe you can play The Last Resident Evil in VR. If you don't get motion sickness, you should check out the PS VR. I really want to get that. I want to get involved in VR because it looks really good. I would, but if I played a Star Wars VR game, would I ever stop? Would I just keep playing for the rest of my life? It seems to me like I would. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings across the cosmos, however you identify. I'm going to bring Rob Observations episode 655 to a conclusion. I have to go do work. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank my moderating staff, beginning with Mike Bodden and the Richard. Uh, I don't know everyone here who's here. Brian Hepburn's here. Bunyan Snipes here. Darren Seeley's here, uh, which is great. Thank you guys for being here. Joshua Levesque is here. Did I say Brian? Did I say Brian Hepburn? I saw that Louise X is here. I think I got everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for being great moderators. I want to thank everybody for genu- generously supporting the channel through super chats and tips and all that. And thank you for writing letters in. If you want to write me a letter, it's free of charge. You can write at the burnetwork.net website. If you like these chats, please hit the like button, subscribe, all that stuff. You know, it helps It helps the analytics of the channel, which is always a good thing. Um, yeah, really good. You guys are so great. Um, uh, uh-oh, Claudius, Claudius sends in, he says, Rob, why are you positive? We're in the middle of an expanding mass of dark matter floating adrift in the void. We don't have any eagle transporters to get back and forth on. If the sun burps, we're all gone. Yeah, that's true, but... Like Jaiman Hansu said at the end of Gladiator, uh, you're right, if the sun burps, we're all gone. But as Jaiman Hansu said, but not yet. Not yet. And until that time, why shouldn't we enjoy existence? You know, there's only one of me. There's only one of me. I mean, remember, I keep going back to um, what Zaphod Beeblebrock said in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy audio drama. He's been put in. He's going to be tortured. They think they're going to torture him. And they put him into the total perspective vortex. And what is that? The total per- perspective vortex is a presumably a machine that you are put into. It's a psychological torture device. And this machine makes you see yourself in relation to the rest of the infinitude of the universe presumably ruining your mind, destroying your sanity by showing exactly how insignificant you really are compared to the rest of creation. And Zaphod Beeblebrox goes into the total perspective vortex. They turn it on. They turn it off. Zaphod comes out, and they're amazed that Zaphod Beeblebrox is still his his chipper self. And they're like, you, you've been into the vortex? Yep. And you've seen yourself in relation to the rest of the universe? Yep. Well, what did you discover? What I knew all the time, that I'm a really great guy. Didn't I tell you? I am Zaphod Beeblebrox. Well, I kind of feel the same way. We're all Zaphod Beeblebrox. There's only one of us in the whole universe. I mean, walk around with that knowledge. There's only one of you in the entire infinitude of creation. Never, unless you're a twin. But even your twin's a little bit different. But if isn't that kind of cool? I mean... You, anyone watching this, can get up with the knowledge that you are the only one of you that exists. And I know someone's going to be, well, what about quantum theory? I, I can't deal with quantum theory. I can't deal with any of that. All I know is that you are the only person, you're the only you in the entire infinity of the universe. That's amazing. Uh, and that's incredible. So for that alone, we should be positive. And on that note, remember... Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. By the way, I need to show you, Claudius, my SR-71, which is over there. Uh, I'll have to bring it down and show it to you at some point or take a picture. Anyway, that's it. The end of Observations, episode 655. I want to thank you. I will be on the John Campy Show tomorrow, and I will be seeing all of you soon. We're going to do – I'm doing John Campia, and we're doing – as and I are doing it. We're on his channel tomorrow doing hot toys. And um, that'll be at noon. Noon my time. So join us for the most ridiculous show on the internet tomorrow. That's fun anyway. We have a lot to talk about. And on that note, I'll say, have a better day.